Welcome to the Free Kiwis podcast. We're very delighted today to have Jacob M. Chimgama with us. Jacob has written a book about free speech, and we'd like to discuss some of the issues he raises in it. So, I mean, one of the things that struck me, Jacob, when I was reading your book was the, the way in which there's been a sort of uneven progression of through history in terms of orientation to free speech. So James and I were talking before about whether we could see your book as endorsing a kind of view that things are generally getting better over time, albeit with a lot of ups and downs, or whether free speech and the other kind of civic rights that come with it uh, thing is something that just arises at a certain time and then falls away again. And you have this fascinating concept of free speech entropy. And I think that, you know, talking about that could be a good way to start today. Yeah, so, you know, I originate the origins of free speech with the Athenian democracy, and that has a, a, a good run. And then, you know, aspects of, of, of free speech is also part of, of Roman republicanism, though I, I would argue a much more elitist, top-down version of free speech than, mm. than, than sort of the more egalitarian for its day Athenian version. But then, you know, there's quite a, quite, quite a long run where, where free speech is, is, is not prominent, even if it would be wrong to look at the Middle Ages as sort of the Dark Ages. There's, there's lots of really interesting, important developments going on there. But you don't have a concept of, of free and equal speech in the Middle Ages like you, like you had in, in, in the Athenian democracy. So, so I don't think that you could sort of say that there's an inevitable process of where, where free speech is, is sort of the, in the ascendancy. And, and you could find lots of moments so you know uh, where, where free speech is, is under pressure so you know the, we, we think of the enlightenment as sort of this is really where the, you, you get the breakthrough of, of free speech but then you know c- along comes the French Revolution you have a huge counter reaction and then sort of in the years after the Napoleonic Wars it's really church and altar and and and, and censorship for, uh, for 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 most part of the 19th century in in, in most parts of, of of, uh, of, of Europe. So one of the ways in which these sort of slipping backs uh, from free speech seem to occur is uh, what Michael and I have started talking about is flip-flopping. You get this uh, people who really are demanding free speech because they're kind of being persecuted. And then once they get into a position of not only safety, but sometimes kind of predominance, they then are the first to turn around and start to persecute other people and try and shut down their free speech. And I think you have several examples of this in, in your book. I mean, maybe Martin Luther is one who, you know, he has to stand up against the, the might of the Catholic Church, and that's very admirable. But then, of course, he himself writes these tracts against the Jews. And, yeah, to what extent do you think this flip-flopping is a, is a big theme in, in history? No, I, I think it's absolutely essential. It's what I call Milton's curse after the, the English poet John Milton, who, who wrote the Areopagitica, where he protests the reintroduction of, of pre-publication censorship. And it's a very eloquent tract, still influential today, but when you read it carefully, it's quite clear that he doesn't mean press freedom for Catholics or... Mm. It's basically free speech for mainline Protestant sects, right? You know, not anyone who's who's a radical. And I think that just goes throughout the history of free speech. And it's probably something to do with human psychology and, and our sort of tribal tribalist instincts. And, and it's very difficult for the human brain, uh, psyche, our, our makeup as a species to accept... You know, free speech becomes very concrete when you yourself are persecuted, but once you are in ascendancy, it becomes an abstract principle when your when your sacred ideas, so to speak, are being attacked and you feel under threat. I wonder if there's a, actually a, you know, perhaps a more charitable interpretation of what happens. I mean, one of the things you you cover in your book is the Russian episode with Catherine the Great, who had some sympathy for the idea of free speech and. She was an Enlightenment figure in many ways. But you quote Radishev, who was a, a bit of a, a dissident, perhaps, at, the, at that time, as saying, you know, in whose head can there be more incongruities than that of a czar? And yeah. she took exception to that. But it seemed to me that it's almost a sympathetic thing to say, because if you are Catherine the Great, you're presiding over this massive and unstable political entity. She didn't have any experience of liberal democracy or what that would look like and, and she, as far as she was concerned the alternative to her imperial power might have been anarchy and chaos so perhaps you know we could look at some of these people at least as 
having a genuine concern that if you allow people to say just anything, it, it could result in catastrophe. No, I think these these sort of enlightened absolutists that you had with both Frederick and Catherine the Great, I actually think they demonstrate the the very intimate link between democracy or at least representative government and free speech that, you know, I, I think she had good intentions, Catherine. So she, she so, thought that, well, free speech to a certain extent will further progress in my realms, but you cannot question my absolute authority to, to rule. And those things, those two concepts just don't go hand in hand. Mm. So in that sense, you know, and, and the same with Frederick the Great, like he was because he was not a very religious <laughs> figure, to, to, to say the least, he, he would allow, you know, Voltaire and, and, and others to say just about anything about a religion, but there were clear limits. You couldn't criticize him personally as a ruler. And Whereas in, in democracies, you need that, you know, it, criticism of, of, of those who rule because they rule in the name of the people and, and the people are sovereign. It's, it's just inherent. You can't have democracy without that. But I, 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 as I said, you know, I think... For most, most of, in many ways, free speech is probably counterintuitive to human beings, you know, as we evolved. Uh, maybe it wouldn't have been great if you were sort of a hunter-gatherer and you and you sit around, everyone ha would have a discussion on, you know, who goes out hunting today and uh, do we really want to uh, do whatever we want to do? You, you need maybe, maybe we should become vegetarians. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And you needed sort of maybe strict hierarchies and, and so on, and, and so you couldn't just allow anyone to say anything. And that served humanity really well for, for a long time. But, you know, as we, uh, if, if you want individual freedom, if you want representative government, then it becomes, you know, you have these clashing ideals that, that clashes with, with basic tenets, perhaps, of, of, uh, of human nature, evolved yeah. over a very long time, and that becomes difficult to reconcile. And so I think all of us uh, have a tendency towards wanting to, to censor uh, others. So one of the pet theories that we have on this Free Kiwis podcast has been that the, the woke left, for the lack of a better term, has basically become more censorious because the left has come into cultural power in various ways, for example, in the universities. And, you know, if you go back to the 1950s, the boot was on the other foot and the right was enjoying this cultural ascendancy. So then through the 50s and the 60s and 70s, even into the 90s w when I was a kid, you know, it was really the left that was more in favor of free speech. So is it just, so is, is the fact that this particular left uh, now seems to have turned against free speech, is that just a product of them succeeding? And that once you succeed and get into certain types of power, you then, as a human being, just have a propensity to want to shut others up? I think that's part of it. It's probably also with a shift in where I think something which, on, on the one hand, should be lauded, sort of a, a genuine concern about minorities and persecuted groups that, that obviously reflect some, some, some deep injustices historically. And, but, but then sort of coming to the conclusion that free speech and equality are values that are perhaps mutually exclusive, at least at the extreme end of the exercise. Free speech, where, where, whereas in the book I argue that free speech and equality are values that are mutually reinforcing. Mm -hmm. But if you truly believe that free speech entrenches unequal power relations, then it becomes uh, logical well, to, uh, to, to want to sort of redistribute power through through restricting free speech for one group and and uh, and and prioritizing the concerns of other groups. But I think you know power relations play plays into it. Once you have that power, you want to. To, to exercise it. So, so, so obviously the left is, is no less immune to that than, than any other group that has, that has gained power. But I think, you know, I still think that there are so many hard progressive leftism, free speech restrictions, there are so many built-in internal contradictions that it becomes much more difficult to uphold, whereas sort of traditional conservative venerance for authority is much more is, is, is easier to construct a speech re repressive regime I, I think yeah one of the interesting things I think about the sort of contemporary attacks on on free speech is that they come from people who purport to be defending minorities and defending the oppressed and so on whereas historically I think your analysis shows that it, restrictions on free, free speech are, are much more often, coming from the position of defending established power. Yeah. It, but I wonder whether that's really the case in terms of the contemporary threat or, or whether 
it is defending established power, but disguising it as a, a, a yeah. as defence of, of, of the, the oppressed. Like I said, I, th- I think it's probably uh, a mix of both. I, I, I think that those who've, like, for instance, if you go to a, a university and they limit academic freedom based on the idea that they want to protect minorities, I think that they generally believe that before they came into power. Uh, and, and and dominated a university, but then once you come into power, you might stretch that belief and and use those justifications to limit free speech, also in order to cement your own power. And the the, the problem, of course, is that you know. So Christianity starts off as a fringe sect that is that is being persecuted on and off in in, in the Roman Empire. Then it becomes the state religion of the Roman Empire, and suddenly Christianity is persecuting not only pagans, but also non-Orthodox Christians. Socialists are being hounded around Europe, very much so also in Tsarist Russia. But the first thing that they do, the, the communists, the Bolsheviks, when, when in power, is to abolish press freedom. So that shows that, you know, even if you are, belong to a persecuted group, you know, if you're allowed to, to limit free speech once you're empowered, then, you know, you, you're, not bas- you're, not, you're not sort of equalizing power relationships. You're, you're, you're inverting them through free speech restrictions and ultimately just creating new hierarchies where those who were the persecuted risk becoming the persecutors. It seems to me that there's, it's worth making the, the ancient Greek distinction but between Parhesia and Isagoria in this, in this regard, because... The idea of Parhesia on its own seems perfectly compatible with using free speech in an elitist way or in an elitist sense. You, you can define it as only for the elites. Only they have Parhesia, you know, the, the right to say, to speak freely. Whereas Isagoria, the, the equality of speech, that's a, you know, from reading your book, that didn't seem to come back after a, ancient Athens until, mm. say, Thomas Paine put it down in the in the rights of man or, or maybe some of those earlier movements like the levelers foreshadowed that but that seems a more advanced mm. version yeah. of free speech than parhesia well i'd be interesting to to, to hear your perspective of that james um but i think that both isagoria and parhesia are sort of embodiments of a commitment to equality and freedom that were that were important ideals of Ath- athenian democracy in and i think I think parasia is important because it's basically a cultural trait. It's basically a commitment to social dissent, which would allow even sort of the, the, the lowborn also to, to voice their opinions. And, and whereas Isagoria is, is limited to the assembly, so it's, it's basically political. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's speech. right. I mean, that's the story I've told and a couple of things I've written about it. Isagoria is really something that is, you find associated with formal political institutions. Yeah. So there's the right of the citizens to have equal speech. Yeah. And it's, the it's, it's the alone. exercise of, of direct democracy, basically, right? That's uh, right, yeah. yeah. So the citizens are formally isoi, they're equal, and they have isonomia, yeah. equality before the law, and they have isagoria, equality of public speech, so public yeah. speech in these political institutions. Yeah. Parasia seems to be something very much wilder than that. So it's associated quite strongly with dramatic festivals, so the kind of ribald comedies of Aristophanes. Yeah. And just as you say also, parasia seems to be associated with this idea that you can have a say even though there's some kind of power above you. So we find it in a lot of texts, including tragedies where people come across you know, mythical kings, because Greek tragedy is often referred to kind of a bygone age. And they say, oh, do I have parasia? Can I speak in front of this higher up person? And fascinatingly, it also applies to, in Platonic dialogues, people who are more kind of oligarchically inclined, they sometimes say to Socrates and his friends, ooh, I'm not sure I can say this. Mm. People like Callicles and Thrasymachus who have very yeah. strongly anti-democratic views. And so what they seem to be fearing there is the democratic opinion of the masses. Yeah. And so and then they say, can I have parousia in this situation? So parousia works yeah. there too. And you see, you see it, uh, you know, Critias, when he sort of justifies the extreme measures of, of, of the 30 times where they sort of put people to death. Uh, you have these death lists, basically, of, 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 of Democrats. And he says sort of, you know, oh, you're complaining that we're killing too many people. Well, that's what you have to do when people have been, when, when the ordinary people have been reared in freedom for too long. That's right. You know, you, you just have to snuff him out. So that su- that 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 suggests that you know it, it's 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 both Isagoria but also Parisia. You can't allow them to, to speak too freely, even in you know in the marketplace or outside uh, yeah. the assembly. Okay, so, well, th- this actually brings us into an- another topic we wanted to go into quite well, which is sort of I suppose the limits of free speech is one way of putting it, but also also where where free speech ultimately resides. 
Right. Yeah, and how to, pr- how to protect it, really, because you might think, okay, the way to protect free speech is to bring in constitutional safeguards, sort of clear laws, which would then really kind of limit the popular will. Or on the other hand, you might think, no, 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 free speech goes hand in hand, as you say, with the quality, with the perception of people's equal. So let's just trust the demos, trust the masses mm-hmm. to be the sort of bearers of a, a kind of civic consciousness that free speech is important. So wh- from your history of free speech, because you've looked at the whole global history of free speech, which one of these do you think is the more promising? Should we have institutional safeguards to make sure that we protect against mob rule, which can sometimes overwhelm free speech? Or should we have really good sort of civic education to make sure everyone is really behind uh, free speech? I think we need both. And I think that's the, the genius of, 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 of Madison, really. James Madison, who, who, who drafted the First Amendment, who has a very clear understanding of, of a much more egalitarian conception of free speech in that will at, ultimately win credence in, in the U.S., as opposed to the more elitist British conception of, of, of free speech. So, so, so you know, so the trial of Socrates is a good example of where even, you know, even if you have a culture and institutions committed to free speech, if someone under the right, quote-unquote, circumstances violates the deepest convictions of, of, the, of, of the majority, then it can it actually devolve into mob rule, and there were no sort of there was no First Amendment or the like that could protect Socrates from from his fate, even if he goaded uh, <laughs> his jurors into to basically forcing them to to find him guilty, and 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 even into you know he could probably have escaped the death penalty, but but sort of went all in. So so I think that the that you I think you need both, but I think that if you don't have a strong, robust culture of free speech, then ultimately the legal limits are likely to be, even if you have the strong legal protections on free speech on paper, are unlikely to be applied in, in, in a speech-protective manner unless you have a critical mass of the population that is committed to robust free speech. That, that seems right to me. And, and, and you give the historical examples, both of the American First Amendment and of the French Revolutionary Constitution, both of which enshrined free speech, but both of which were violated within two or three years of, of being put in place by the very same people who, who wrote that that constitution. Sure. And, 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 but so, so that's, that's true. So in, in the US, like the First Amendment was ratified in 1791, and by 1798, you had the, the passage of the Alien and Sedition Act, and, and the Sedition Act is signed by, by John Adams and his Federalist Party, and it protects the President and Congress, all dominated by Federalists, and the oppositions are the Democratic Republicans, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson uh, principally. So you have these this generation, the founding generation, who had agreed that you know free speech was the bulwark of liberty when fighting the British, and suddenly they're sort of divided over the limits of, of free speech. And then in France, you know, I think there's a reason why the French Revolution and its disagreement over the limits of free speech become much more violent than mm-hmm. the clashes in in America. Uh, in America, you'd had a culture of free speech since going uh, going back to the early 18th century, especially after a, a trial called the Sanger case, where a jury in New York refused to find a, a printer guilty, and and since then it, it became almost impossible to find anyone have anyone convicted for seditious libel in jury cases, and that sort of enshrined a culture, a more robust culture of free speech in, in the U.S. But in France, revolutionary f- France comes basically from very elaborate pre- and post-publication censorship system that was somewhat weakened for a small elite of philosophers towards the, towards the end, but there was no, there wasn't an equivalent to the robust culture of free speech. And so the different classes of strata of, of French society could not agree on, on where the limits were, and, and it sort of ended up deciding it by guillotine. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so I think that demonstrates the need for a culture of free speech. You, you quote Learned Hand, the, the American jurist, and I'm paraphrasing him, but basically it seemed that his view was that free speech as a cultural value was the paramount thing. That, yeah, it has, has to reside in the hearts of men, and then you know, no constitution is, is going to protect it otherwise. Yeah, and, and yeah. if it doesn't yeah. rest there, then yeah. you know, no, no constitution can, can protect it. And, and you know, George Orwell says says much the same. He says, you know, if, if people are interested in, in free speech, there will be free speech even if the law doesn't protect it. And and, and if people are not interested in, in free speech, inconvenient minorities will be persecuted even if the if, if the law protects it. So so I think, and, and, and of course, John Stuart Mill, uh, also, you know, on liberty is very much about society, I guess Victorian society's imposition of norms on, on dissenters, which he views 
you know, tyranny of majority as being as much of a danger as the tyranny of the magistrate. So there's a long history, I would say, of viewing you know, society's tendencies to, to limit free speech through intolerance as dangerous as legal limits on, on free speech. This mention of you know, tolerance, it might be a good time to discuss Karl Popper's paradox of, of tolerance. Written, written here, right? In, written here in New Zealand yeah. uh, during World War II when he was a, a refugee. Yeah. We've had a little bit of debate with Jonathan about this, and, and James has actually done some work with Brian Boyd, who's a, a New Zealand scholar of Popper, on this. So do, do you want to Well, I mean, it, all just go, it kind of goes into this question of, you know, once we're, we've decided to sort of instill in the people a, a sense of free speech, where do we set the bounds? Or even if we yeah. want to set up a constitutional safeguard for free speech, where do we set the bounds? And I yeah. think that there's a notorious cartoon which has gone around social media claiming, purporting to sort of show Popper's view on this, and it seems like they would have Popper as saying, you know, anybody who expresses intolerant ideas, we should be intolerant of that. But if you go deeper, and Brian Boyd and I have, have done this, if you go deeper into Popper's writings, it seems like Popper actually had a very high bar for what he saw as intolerance in that situation. And it was basically uh, people who were, who were willing to use violence. So political movements who were intent on undermining democracy through violence, and chiefly, of course, Obviously, considering because of his personal history, Popper had in mind there the Nazis. Yeah. Although he was also concerned about the, Thomas, the yeah. far, far left uh, yeah. as well. I mean, he had some experience with that in Vienna. So, so Popper. So this is actually kind of a classical liberal thing, I think, that Popper is continuous with maybe some other people like Mill and perhaps Berlin, that they, they place the limits of free speech at actual violence. And they sort of say that's really the moment when, when you have to stop or, you know, it's clear incitement to violence. Yeah, so so in in that very famous passage in uh, for uh, about about you know how tolerance of intolerance will will lead to the destruction of tolerance. This it's accompanied by a footnote, which where he sort of says that you know this should only be applied to you know if if you can basically reach people through argument that that's that, right. that that's that's the, the preferred method and and it should only be in exceptional cases. I don't know you know you. You've studied his scholarship more than, than me, but from that from 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 that passage and from that quote, it doesn't seem to me that he suggests that the limit might necessarily be incitement to violence. But it's clear that that he doesn't mean anyone who expresses an intolerant idea should. should I, I actually think that he, he he's identified a problem that he didn't know the answer to yeah. ultimately, and, and, and of I, course, and I think yeah. that the issue actually is it comes back to the value base for for free yeah. speech, and I, I guess my personal perspective is. In some ways, it's a fairly grim one because I, I don't think, like, like Leonard Hand said, that we can protect it through legal me means alone by any means. It, it's doomed if, if it's not resident in, in our value base. Yeah. But there is no way to guarantee it being resident no, in our, our, our value base. Free, free speech is, is, is an experiment, right? But someone who is mu much more sort of provides the basis of, of what we call militant democracy is Karl Löwenstein, who's also a, a, a German emigre, a professor of political science and, and law. And he, he writes these very influential articles in Colombia. I think he's at Colombia. So he, he, he writes these articles on militant democracy where he basically says that European democracies have been far too lenient towards fascist movements and, and, and ad adopted way to speech protective measures and, and that you need to be to crack down basically on, on fascist movements. But what he ignores is that uh, that in, in the Weimar Republic in, uh, in Germany, there were quite a number of speech restrictions, some of them quite draconian. So heavy censorship of the radio, uh, ability of German states to ban by administratively newspapers if they spread false information or attack government. And, and the Nazis were very frequently targets of that and i think even more damningly those extreme those emergency measures meant to protect democracy were ultimately used by the nazis when they came into power to abolish free speech you, you uh, make the point that they've actually they actually used that as an argument they said well yeah. you didn't you did it to us so yeah you know, hitler uh, hosts you know there's a there's a social democrat called otto wells who's who argues against hitler and, and hitler i mean obviously if you go back to the early speeches of Hitler, it, it it's perfectly clear that he has no time for free speech at all. Uh, so so, uh, but but it it basically gives him what about boundary points, and he says, you know, if you were so happy about free speech, why did you ban me from speaking around the the country? Why did you close down our newspapers? And now you come talking about free speech when we want to uh, to 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 set our limits. 
And of course, th those limits were quite more <laughs> draconian than, than those of, of liberals and, and, and social democrats. But, but I think, you know, the, even before the Weimar Republic, you know, if you go back to the days of Bismarck, for instance, he adopted these uh, anti-socialist laws, which threw hundreds of, of German journalists, socialists and social democrats into prison and banned socialist and social democratic parties and 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 so so this is so I, I call it the Weimar fallacy because of, the, of this history so the idea that if you want to protect democracy against totalitarian extremist movements you have to to ban uh, certain forms of speech now that doesn't mean that if you if you don't you know if you protect all kinds of, of, of speech short of incitement to violence that that democracy is safeguarded you know as I said you know no one can guarantee the survival of of, of, of democracy, and you can't guarantee that there won't be a movement that comes into power through democratic means, having used speech, and will do away with it. But what you can guarantee is that every authoritarian government, the very first thing it will do is to limit free speech. Yeah. I want to move to the modern day and uh, talk about you know how much of a threat is there to free speech right now. But I was interested in re reading your chapter on medieval Europe. You have some interesting statistics about the, the Inquisition. So you, talk about this inquisitor, Bernard Gouy, and you say, of more than 900 sentences of heresy that he handed down, he only handed 42 people over to the authorities to be burnt at the stake. And I, <laughs> I read that and I thought, well, that's kind of nice. You know, it's only 42 out of nine, 900, more than 900 sentences. But at the same time, you know, he burned 42 people at the stake. Yeah. So obviously we aren't in that universe anymore. <laughs> Thank goodness. We're not in the universe where we're burning people at the stake. However, there's often this argument in the modern day, you know, that we, we point out instances of people being deplatformed at universities or occasionally academics losing their jobs. And the response is often, yeah, okay, that's like a piddling, a piffling figure of like three or four academics, you know, five or six uh, deplatformings. What's the big deal? And I, I think that, you know, in the medieval case, obviously, this, this is probably a very strong effect. In the modern case, you might have had, you might have a similar effect. There's also this chilling effect, right? Yeah. There's also this thing that I haven't been burned at the stake, but I could see that this other guy who had heretical ideas or had you know, yeah. free thinking about Jesus or the Bible uh, ended up like that. So I'm not going to take a risk. And similarly, even though you know there's great differences in the modern academy, it might be something like, well, you know, I'm probably not going to lose my job, but I just want to be safe because I know that that one other guy did. Yeah, no, I think I think I think you're absolutely right in in that in that it'll have a it's, it's the same, like, if you go to Saudi Arabia, you might say, well, maybe, I, I don't know the exact figure, but maybe only two people in the last decade were executed for blasphemy. So d does that mean that, that Saudi Arabia is, is, is a moderate country when it, comes to, when it comes to blasphemy of Islam? Of course not. It just means that, you know, that, you know the risk is there and, and, and you're not going to take that chance. And of course, like someone like Ben Agui, there were other punishments. So they would use, they would put you in prison on remand basically for years and years. Uh, they would in some cases use torture and th what they would do is, is shame you publicly by sort of giving you prominent symbols that you should wear as a heretic walking around in public that w would show you as, as, a, as a danger to community as, uh, as a heretic. So, so but I, I think it was just important to sort of, there have been these tropes that sort of both the Spanish Inquisition and the medieval Inquisition would burn all heretics and, and that, 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 just is not true. But that doesn't mean that some of the other less draconian punishments weren't very effective in in clamping down on heretical views. And and you know, even though I don't think we should take the the, the analogy from the medieval Inquisition into the limits being put on academic freedom today too far, then obviously if you see someone whose career is being ruined or is being disciplined by by university administration, uh, then then that is likely to to dampen the willingness of a lot of other colleagues to to say something controversial. There are a lot of different levels to it, aren't there? And it, and it, it does come back to the extent to which free speech is held as a value in a culture. Mm. If you have even if you, if you have no fear of legal sanction or even losing your job or something like that, if if you live in a culture where free speech is not valued. You find yourself a pariah, yeah, essentially, and that and that has a strong effect on human psychology. It, it's interesting. Uh, Nick Cave, of all people, actually wrote something really interesting about cancel culture, where he said it's bad religion run amok. In his sort of blog, Red Hand Files, he, he wrote something very perceptive. I thought about about cancel culture and uh, quite eloquent, and and so that is that uh, analogy. Even though, of course, again, the consequences for 
the individual academic who might dissent from whatever orthodoxy is, is prevalent at their institution will not suffer the same consequences as someone who deviated <laughs> from, uh, no. from... from But the effect may nonetheless be the same to, to kind of stamp yeah. out... Sure, sure, know, sure. Free exchange uh, the, of ideas. Sure, sure. Though, of course, you know, it would probably take a lot more bravery to stand up against Bernard Guy in uh, in the medieval period than it w- would take to be to, to stand up against orthodoxy by your university administrators well, or you'd think, you'd you, think you would that think would be the case. From, from which we can only conclude that the modern academy are such terrible cowards yeah but but, <laughs> but, but uh, on the other hand you know you, there are you know uh, great institutions and, and others who've sort of rallied against this tendency so there is pushback against it is something that is being discussed debated which would probably have been very difficult in, to write write something against Bernagi and, and get away with it. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, well, we're, we're aware that you have limited time today because you're very busy fighting the good fight, speaking around New Zealand. So we'll end there. We'll just say thank you so much for, for joining us and best wishes with the rest of your, your tour. Thank you. It was an absolute pleasure.